All right. Uh, so far in this course, I always explain the theory first. Then I will I gave some examples about Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other blockchain. So today I will do the opposite way. I will uh, talk about how transactions are done in uh, Bitcoin. So I will first talk about single signatures then multi signatures, uh, and then I will move on to new property of Bitcoin, which is Schnorr signatures, which actually allows key aggregation, which is somewhat very useful. Okay, so let's first start with the single signature case where we pay to public key hash. Okay, so let's recall, uh, let K be a point on the elliptic curve. This is the uh, elliptic curve of Bitcoin. So this is actually a public key. So any point on this uh, curve, actually any a point that is generated by the generator of the group is can be used as a public key. So if you know the private key for this public key, you can uh, receive funds using that public key. Okay. So if we look at it, it is actually uh, has it has two coordinates which are 256 bit. So this point K can be represented with a 512 bit value. But this is something huge, so it is hard to represent. So instead of using this, we simply do the following. We take this public key, first compute SHA-256 of it, then compute RIPE-MD-106 of it, and let's say the result is A. This is actually a resulting Bitcoin address. So this is actually what the money you are sending to. But uh, this is 120 bits. So 20 bytes. If it were 20 characters, it would be very easy to represent. But not every byte is printable on the screen, right? So we cannot represent every byte on the screen. So we have to do some kind of encoding here so that we can visualize these bits. Okay. So generally in computer science, people use base 64 for encoding. But in Bitcoin, a base 58 is preferred. And there is also an error checking mechanism put inside this kind of encoding. So let's see what it is. Base 58 encoding works like this. So you have the data. In our case, it is 160 bits of the ha output hash. So we add a prefix to the data called the version byte. So we put a single byte value, and actually it represents what kind of a wallet it is. OK. So you put a single byte in front of your uh, hash output, then you take the SHA-256 of it and also perform another SHA-256 to it, okay? So this way you actually generate 256 bits, but you look at the first four bytes of this double hash value, we call it a checksum, and the checksum of these four bytes are actually added to the end of this prefix and your data. So now what you have is your prefix, which is a single version byte, then your uh, data, which is in our case 160 bit hash value, then a checksum, which is four bytes coming from double SHA 256. So this whole data now encoded using base 58 alphabet. Okay. So this checksum is used for error correcting, error detection, sorry, but base 58 is used to represent it as a human readable form. So let me give you an example. This is our base 58 alphabet, okay? It looks very similar to base 64, but main differences are as follows. As you can see here, there isn't zero here, okay? There isn't the letter O, capital O, but we have the small O. So these capital O and zero are removed so that people wouldn't confuse them with the other letters like small o or zero and so on. Similarly, we have capital L here, but we don't have small l here because the small l generally confused with one because in some of the encodings, it looks exactly the same, right? So in some fonts, one and small l actually the same. So for this reason, uh, to avoid confusion, these uh, characters are removed from the alphabet. This is, these are the main differences from base 64 and base 58. So let me give you an example. So assume that I have a, a public key. 
I calculate SHA-256 of it, then I calculated ripe MD-160 of it, and for some reason I was lucky and obtained such a, a structured output. Okay, so this is 20 bytes, 160 bits. So this is my hash output of my public key. So let's encode this using base 58. I told you that I have to put a one byte value in front of it. So this is the version number. In single uh, signatures where you're actually generating a, a public key wallet addresses, you simply add the byte zero here. So this was my hash value. I put a single zero byte in front of it. Then I calculate double SHA-256 of this value. So I put this. This is 256 bits. But I told you that the first four bytes will be our checksum. So I take the first byte, first four bytes. This will be my checksum. So I will take this four bytes, put it here, then convert it into base 58. So the result is this. Okay, this is a valid uh, Bitcoin wallet address. So as you can see, it starts with one. This is not a coincidence because as the input byte, as the version number, I put the zero byte here. When you perform the base 58 encoding, it turns into one. So every Bitcoin wallet address actually starts with one. So this is the main idea. So this is also important for forensics investigators because whenever you look at this kind of value, you could easily understand that this is a Bitcoin wallet address. Okay. Of course, in the future slides, we will see three here and we will explain why it is the case, okay? But for a, a basic wallet addresses, this is one and this is the main way of doing it, okay? So whenever you want to send a Bitcoin to address, this will be the thing that you are actually telling your wallet software to send money to, okay? And whenever you expect money from others, again, your wallet address will be something like this. And this will be the number that you will give people so that they can send you money, okay? So, ah, all right, here are two uh, links I took from the internet. You can, uh, if you want to experiment with this, of course you can write your own codes, but you can also use some online calculators. For base 58, I found something like this. It is uh, really useful to encode and decode. And if you want to calculate SHA-256, Again, you can do it in many different ways, but I wanted to give an online calculator because some people have trouble when they uh, try to calculate uh, hash values. For instance, some people take this value, put it inside an uh, online calculator or any SHA-256 uh, implementation, they put it inside and they realize that, that their output is not the same as this. And here the problem is that here I'm actually representing this as an hexadecimal value, right? But if you just copy past this on a generic software, they will think that you are actually putting characters, not hexadecimals. So in software, for instance, in this calculator, you have to select if it is a character or if it is a hexadecimal value, okay? And some uh, calculators don't support hexadecimal characters. So this is why some people uh, end up with uh, wrong hash value. So this is important. Some people have some trouble, so I wanted to mention this. So let's, so, uh, in the next slide, I will talk why this checksum is actually useful. So let's give some basic definitions again. I told you that for the version byte as the prefix, for the public keys, we use the zero byte. And when you perform the base 58 encoding, the result is one. This is why the wallet addresses start with one. But there are other types, for instance, for pay to script hash addresses, which will be our next topic, you put the hexadecimal value five, but as the base 58 encoding, it will result in three. So most of the time, whenever you look at the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, you will see wallet addresses that start with one or three, okay? So in the three case, you will understand that this is not actually a wallet address, or I mean, it is not a, uh, address that belongs to a public key, but actually it belongs to a hash of a secret. That is the main idea. And we will actually talk about this in the next slides. 
And for the private keys, we use the uh, hexadecimal value 80. And in the, at the result, it sometimes ends up with 5K or L. <clears throat> of course, we generally don't give our private keys to other people. So it doesn't matter. You wouldn't see wallet addresses that start with 5K or L. It is for your own uh, encoding because you want to store it someplace. Uh, in paper wallets, you have to write it on the paper and so on. So this is a easy way to remember. But again, uh, storing private keys is an important problem. So let's look at the checksum. The four bytes of the double shot 256, which we call checksum, is used to detect errors. So error detection prevents sending bitcoins to invalid addresses. So this is the main idea. Because whenever you're typing your wallet address, then you might press a wrong button or you might uh, confuse a letter with something else when you look at it. So you can actually write a wrong wallet address. So if you do it and send money to a wrong wallet address, it will be lost because nobody will be able to withdraw it because for that public key, we don't know what the private key is, right? In order to prevent this, uh, Bitcoin has, has this kind of uh, property where it can detect if a wallet address is valid or not. This checksum is actually for that. So assume that there is an error in the base 58 representation. So you took a wallet address, but you, uh, for a single character, you clicked on the wrong button and you actually uh, wrote a wrong uh, wallet address. So uh, when the error corresponds to the checksum, which means that at the end of your wallet address, then we always detect the error because the hash value will not be the same as this one. But if it occurs in the middle part, where it, it is related to your data, then the error corresponds to a public key hash, and uh, we detect the error with probability 1 minus 1 over 2 to the 32. So let me explain what I mean here. So let's go back. So assume that this is your wallet address. Somebody gave you this wallet address. Now, when you want to send money to it, actually what you do is as follows. From this base 58 representation, you go back and represent it as this. And the checksum with, uh, you represent it with this. Then you perform the same checksum operation. So you take double SHA-256 of this value, obtain this checksum, and check this one matches with this part. Okay, so if it checks, then you say that, okay, this is a correct address. So if there is a, some kind of a typo here, then when you convert this base 58 to hexadecimal values, the checksum corresponding to this part will be different than this one. So we will definitely say that they are not the same, right? But what if this happens here? So assume that you made a mistake here. Instead of A, you press B, okay, when you go back, so some place here, we will see some different values. Question is, is it still possible to have something different here? But when I take the double SHA-256, it still gives me this four, bit, four byte value. The answer is yes, because your input space is really huge and the output space is four bytes. So there will definitely be collisions. So question is, what is the probability of it? So here you have 32 bits. So we are checking if an input would give us this 32-bit value. And this 32-bit value, you know, it is like uh, tossing 32 coins. So having an, uh, these 32 coins in a specific order has probability 1 over 2 times, 1 over 2 times, 1 over 2 times, which means 32 times. It's, so this means that the probability is 1 over 2 to the 32. So if you are really unlucky, you can make a mistake in this wallet address, but your software will, can still think that it is a correct one due to this probability, okay? So, which is very close to zero. So you should be very unlucky. It happens four billion to one, okay? So very, very small probability, but it can still happen. So let's recall how we paid transactions to this uh, wallet addresses. So Bitcoin wallet addresses are uh, we said that the opcode with hash 160 results of public keys, that means that first we calculate SHA-256 of this key, 
then perform ripe MD 160 of it. So this is the output. And then we convert it into base 58. When a data instruction appears in a script, the data is simply pushed on the top of the stack. Opcodes perform some function, often taking as input data that is on top of the stack. The most common pay to public key hash transaction is as follows. So actually, this is how you write a transaction. So the first part actually called unlocking, and the second part is called locking. So actually, here you unlock some amount of Bitcoin because here you prove that it actually belongs to you by providing the public key and the signature that belongs to this public key and the signature actually the signature of this transaction. Then you are actually transferring this amount of Bitcoin to somebody else and that somebody else's public key hash is provided here, okay? Which comes from actually the wallet address that you received, which starts with one. So that is the whole idea, okay? So this is how you create your transaction. And the output is payable to whoever can present a signature from the key, pub, private key that corresponds to this public key hash, okay? Which you obtain from the wallet address that we represented with base 58, okay? So this is how a single transaction works and this is how a single signature is used to transfer money from one place to another. So most wallet addresses support this but we will talk about multi-signatures and there you will need some kind of a special software where you can construct uh, more complex scripts, let's say. But let's recall how this actually works in practice. Whenever you do this, you are trying to prove that the money belongs to you by this unlocking part. So every node, actually every miner has to check if you are telling the truth. So uh, they perform the following operations. So you provide your signature for that transaction they put it on top of the stack. You also provide the public key, actually whose hash is included in the previous transaction that you are trying to spend. So it is also put on top of the stack. Then this uh, check operations is performed. Optive actually duplicates this public key value, then takes the uh, hash 160, which is actually performing SHA-256 and then write PAM to do this value. So you obtain with this hash. And the question mark means that you are trying to spend the money that is transferred to you in previous transactions. And this public key hash value is transferred from that transaction so that they are going to check if this value really equals to this one. So this way you are actually proving that you are trying to spend the money that is actually in your wallet. So that is actually sent to your public key. So op equal verify op code actually checks if these two values are the same. If they are not, actually uh, this code is ends, nothing is written to the blockchain. But if they are equal, they are removed from the stack. So we end up with the public key and the signature that you initially provided. Now the check seek, uh, opcode actually check if the signature really valid for the transaction that you are trying to perform, okay? So this is how you check a single uh, signature, but in multi-signatures, we will use multi-check seek opcode here, and there we will check multiple signatures. So this is why I wanted to talk about the single signature case here. Then we will move on to multi-signatures, then we will move on to Schnorr signatures and talk about key aggregation. 